senior policy analyst Krista Brown and senior fellow Mo Tastic uh, of the American Economic Liberties Project. Uh, welcome, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Um, so you guys wrote a, uh, a a real big piece on Ticketmaster's uh, dark history, and it's entitled that at theprospect.org. And uh, folks can get a little bit of a taste. Of, Mo, I know you put up a, a thread yesterday in sort of like anticipation of of, of both you guys watching the um, uh, the hearings yesterday. Let's let's just go into the history uh, a little bit of Ticketmaster. It, I have to say that when I read the piece, like it, it all sort of came back to me. Like I, I grew up in Boston area. I remember Don Law. I remember like the sort of the evolution of these things. I remember when, um, you know, Eddie Vedder and uh, Pearl Jam uh, did this stuff, and I, you know, being skeptical of what their motives were because I was a fan of Nirvana, like you know, pre, you know, like. Uh, uh, teen spirit and so i was just skeptical of the whole thing and didn't pay that much attention and now i feel like an ass for that so um what uh mo do you want to start with like maybe like that early history of of Ticketmaster? uh yeah i was definitely on team kurt um in the in those squabbles i was 15 when this was happening so i remember it pretty vividly and i remembered more what happened afterwards in terms of just the tsunami of consolidation in the entertainment industry that took something that I thought was pretty great, which was American pop culture of the early 90s, um, and turned it into just this um, really like tyrannically vacuous cesspool. Um, and as it turns out, these things were connected. It kind of all started with um, the crushing of Pearl Jam. Um, but where it really started was in the 80s. Um, and there were a couple of moguls um, and the concert promoter, there was this sort of loosely uh, organized cartel of regional concert promoters that Ticketmaster kind of um, lent money to, to, to bid up um, the prices of, of uh, you know, high, high profile acts and, um, and split the fees with. Um, so there, the CEO of Ticketmaster back in the uh, 80s um, with this guy, Fred Rosen, and his friend, Irving Azoff, who at the time was CEO of MCA, um, they really were almost plotting, I feel like, in, in the 80s to dominate the music industry. And um, and we're living that reality today. But um, Pearl Jam... And can I just add, I just want to say, you know, just for, for context, the, the, the early to mid to late eighties seemed to be, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but seemed to be the absolute pinnacle of like the touring, uh, world of, of concerts. I mean, I, I, I worked at a, at a parking lot in Worcester next to our civic center. And it was, I mean, it was constant. Like it was a 13,000, uh, uh, a person arena and it was booked every weekend. Like the touring was amazing at that time. Um, I think that there was it, there there was definitely a really vibrant scene, and back then it was like I said, it was a loosely um, controlled cartel. There were a lot of um, of very powerful promoters. Um, they were putting a lot of money. There was a there's a legendary Canadian promoter named Michael Cole who um, who offered the Rolling Stones like fifty five million dollars for one concert tour, and this was like unheard of back in the day. And I'm pretty sure that that money was fronted by Ticketmaster. Um, so that kind of got this whole thing off the ground where every big act really felt like they needed to tour every year. Um, and um, it, uh, it, it gradually turned into um, a more sort of centrally controlled and, um, and now it's much more kind of, it's, it's a less extravagant industry. There's a lot more cost cutting, a lot more classic corporate um, bullshit. <clears throat> Well, let's, uh, Krista, talk about uh, those hearings uh, with with Pearl Jam because the, and and how they, you know, sort of like, um, I guess, um, you know, sort of decided like why they had a problem with Ticketmaster and then how they got sort of like pulled in to testify um, and how they just got crushed after that. 
Yeah, it's a pretty depressing part of the story. But basically, they wanted to make their tour affordable. And Ticketmaster was demanding a higher fee attached to their face value. They wanted to keep it under $20. So they decided, like, we're going to basically attempt a tour avoiding Live Nation and Ticketmaster's services, really just Ticketmaster's services. Um, and amidst all that, they came up against a bunch of retaliatory behavior where venues had ticketing services shut off, kind of inexplicably so. Um, and then immediately, like right before the concert turned back on, but definitely a threatening move from Ticketmaster. And amongst all this, you know, they were pretty public about it. Uh, and the DOJ asked them to write a complaint. The DOJ had been kind of watching Ticketmaster ever since 1991 when they merged with Ticketron, uh, although that merger probably should have been blocked, it wasn't. And so the DOJ yeah, basically said, can you to help us kind of announce an investigation, write a complaint about what you've experienced? So they did. And the DOJ, you know, announced an investigation, but within a year uh, after the hearing, it was dropped with like a two sentence explanation. It kind of made no sense that the explanation was, well, there appears to be competition or like venues are, are willingly going into these uh, agreements. So it can't be a monopoly. But when you kind of like uncover what actually happened, there was a lot of pretty blatant corruption, actually, where Phil Graham, who was the head of the Appropriations Committee at the time, had a, um, a very close relationship with this man, Charlie Black, who was a strong lobbyist. His wife was the head of government affairs. They hired her in the midst of all of these investigations um, to be Ticketmaster's head of government affairs. So there's just a, a bunch of inner workings that I wish we had more to uncover, but we definitely at least highlighted a little bit of it. And to be clear, when you say set the ticket prices, the, the, and I don't think people sort of like, I, I certainly didn't understand this at the time, that Ticketmaster would, that the, the way that, that prices get, I mean, the way that tickets get priced, I mean, it's not like, we're going to charge 20 bucks and Ticketmaster says, okay, well, we take our 10%. And then so the tickets will cost 21 bucks. They actually set the prices of the tickets? Well, so uh, Pearl Jam will say, we want to price our ticket. Uh, Mo, do you remember the exact pricing they had for that tour, the 1995 tour? They um, they determined basically that they would need to it to be like around $18, 18 to yeah, break 18. even. So they were only trying to break even. Pearl Jam had sold a monstrous number of records. They were just looking to not lose money on the tour because they regularly did lost, lose money playing charity events. Um, and, and then they tack on, yeah, so it was Ticketmaster that said, we'll tack on this $2, above a $2 fee. Yeah. What it was was that- Pearl Jam wanted $2. When, yeah, when Pearl Jam wanted to, to not go above $2 and, and what Ticketmaster really resented was that Pearl Jam was trying to negotiate. They were kind of looking down the, the whole kind of supply chain and Ticketmaster really reserved the right to make the service charges whatever they needed to be to pay off all of the ancillary middlemen involved. And that was sort of- Wait, the, Mo, can I chime in there? Sure. It's when they say- um, like what's what Ticketmaster needs. Ticketmaster gained almost all of its power through these exclusive contracts with venues that they would pay an upfront charge. It was like $500,000 at times to the venue to gain exclusivity and jack up fees for the customer to cover that. So it was like, we're going to loss lead almost and then regain a recoup through fees from the from the fans and that had never been the case before. And they did and this the is sort of like a, it's like a pre kickback, right? I mean, that's basically what it is. It's a, it's a kickback, but it comes, you're reversing the sort of like, uh, the, the sequencing of the kickback. So mm -hmm. you're, you're eliminating before there's even, and people should understand what, what this dynamic is before there's even a tour before even Pearl Jam's there, they have basically purchased, they've basically rented almost every uh, facility or the only, or they've bought options on all these facilities and 
and you need us before anybody before there's even an act and then they uh, it's it's basically just a kickback and they right. recoup the funds through the service fees yeah they they extended loans i mean by the 90s the um the uh advances that they would give to venues were up to $5 million, but they also gave non-recourse loans to concert promoters to front the money that they needed to bid on the act. So that's again, how, um, and, and, and rock stars in a lot of cases, they didn't like this game, but they didn't see any way of sort of, um, going against it, especially after Pearl Jam with Pearl Jam, what they were trying to do is teach a lesson and it worked. Um, the, uh, what what strikes me about all of this is that this is happening in the the late 80s uh i mean or, or you know in in the 90s right around the time or right in the build up to uh the clinton administration uh signing off and and, and happening in congress the rescinding of the uh, the the fincin laws and because this is really a similar you know dynamic these were laws that existed in this country for about 70 years at the time that uh, basically said you cannot own a movie theater if you're a movie studio because you'll only feature movies from your own studio if you own the theater and that's going to suck for people who want to see a bunch of different movies or it's going to cost more to see a movie from a rival studio or something like that and they have basically instituted in some you know slightly different way but the dynamic is it's basically a, like a a financial interest syndication type of a relationship where they, they're getting paid on both ends and they're excluding anybody else, any type of competition whatsoever. Exactly. Absolutely. And actually um, the gentleman from jam production. So there's a, a one of the lone remaining um, independent concert promoters um, who didn't sell out to this, this network really it was called clear channel. Um, first it was called SFX and it was clear channel then live nation now Ticketmaster. Um, in the nineties, they all kind of got rolled up and consolidated by this guy, Bob Sillerman. And, uh, one of the guys who didn't sell out, um, owned a promoter called jam productions in Chicago. They've been really, really vocal about, um, this, this whole issue. And they brought up the, uh, FinCEN laws yesterday, um, and, uh, at the, at the hearing and gave some really great testimony. Well, all right. So let's and uh, uh, so we got that Pearl Jam situation. They also made an exception w with the Grateful Dead because the Grateful Dead, for for again for for people younger than I, um, they would they would be on the road for something like I don't know three hundred and three hundred and forty days a year. It felt like, and um, they could have they, they wanted to make sure that their fans. Uh, that deadheads could get tickets and that they were sort of like available through the relationship that the band had with their audience. And they ended up getting an exception, but that exception almost became sort of like, like right. a, like a sacred vow that they would never, that the ticket master uh, and whatever iteration it was in would never extend to anybody else. Can you tell us about that Mo? I don't think that um, Pearl Jam was totally aware of what had happened because the dead did have to threaten to sue and they had to have some pretty high priced lawyers. And you have to think about the dead was not beholden to any aspect of the music industry. They were, you know, they, they didn't really believe in intellectual property. They made all their money through touring. They um, mailed all of their tickets to uh, to their fan clubs personally. I mean, they had this whole operation. They were very yeah, vertically, vertically integrated operation on that note mo it's like helpful for people to know who are my age or younger they had their own ticketing service the yes. people get that ticketing service and they would do really funny things like put an entire row of people named brian in in, in their doors which is like ridiculous but they had a personal relationship with everyone and people loved their service and and they were they were i think the uh, if not, uh, certainly the biggest band, if not the only band that would actively encourage people to come in, record the concert. They would have like special areas where, you know, uh, the folks would come in with full on rigs, like, you know, uh, like you'd have a, a 10 foot pole with microphones and, uh, and record these and that, you know, that, so they were a completely different sort of like animal. And even they had to struggle with this. That's the amazing thing about it. 
Yeah, I thought, I, I mean, I found that incredible as well, because they, um, they really, I mean, their relationships with the concert promoters, this is another thing that was a departure from Pearl Jam, their relationship with these concert promoters, like Don Law, way predated the existence of Ticketmaster. They'd been doing this since the 60s. So, but Fred Rosen, you know, bless his heart, um, he, he tried to get up in there and, and, and say that they would not be able to play any of the venues that Ticketmaster repped uh if if you know they didn't give Ticketmaster all the tickets now they did eventually uh you know carve out an exception but they weren't about to do it for Pearl Jam um so the next big sort of fight after Pearl Jam comes with Aerosmith um can you walk us through that one well Aerosmith what Aerosmith I think you know um uh, Steve Tyler uh, had gotten clean in the 80s and sort of gone on this comeback um, mission. And he really wanted to, you know, the little guy to get access to his tickets. And he was reading headlines about uh, kids spending, you know, camping out all night and not getting um, any tickets, getting kind of turned away. Um, and he went to Ticketmaster to try and do something like the, the Grateful Dead did because they had a pretty thriving um, uh, fan club and, and be able to kind of distribute the tickets themselves, a certain portion, 50% of the um, tickets themselves to the fan clubs. Uh, Fred Rosen said, what about we uh, raise the price of the ticket $2 and you can have $1, <laughs> something like that. Basically tried to buy him off. Um, off his his um his manager, I should say. And um that sort of when Pearl Jam, and this is was something that is is sort of when Pearl Jam decided to take on this battle, Aerosmith was one of the bands that stood up and said, yes, absolutely, you know, I'll I've got your back. REM was up there. Garth Brooks was up there. Even you two. Um, notably, a lot of these guys have uh, have, you know, joined the dark side, but it's not particularly um surprising given how much more power they have amassed, especially since CD sales are not, um, you know, they're a fraction of what they were. Um, physical music sales have sort of um, evaporated and thus Which Live Nation Ticketmaster no. is the most powerful company in music. I think on that note, one thing we didn't include in the article, but we, we had a lot we wish we did, was this uh, acquisition of Instant Live where they, I think it was Clear Channel, bought the patent to record the live concert and then sell immediately at an incredibly discounted price at all. Uh-oh. Oh, Chris is frozen. Oh, no. Um, yeah, oh, well, oh, wait. Oh, oh, so, Chris, is sorry. We lost side. you for a moment. And, oh, um, am I back? Okay. Yeah, you're back. So, wait a second. You were saying that the, the, okay. that... Clear Channel had this outfit called uh, Instant Live. They would mm -hmm. uh, record the thing and then put it out live uh, quickly. And so what happened to that outfit? So they just completely undercut all the CD or album sales the artists actually made money off of. And that was in like 2001, 2002, I believe. And it just stripped them of that revenue stream. And 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 did the did the bands have to sign off on that or was it like oh this just comes with the uh, if you play in this venue you got to do this with the venue yeah, yeah exactly. it comes with the package so they're completely disempowered in this instance they're yeah. just watching these this this conglomeration between the relationship between the venues and Ticketmaster and uh, and and and, and really a, a radio company essentially or uh, just basically pull different parts of their revenue streams just away from them without any ability to deal with it whatsoever. Uh, I, I, I also learned from your, from your piece that, um, the Aerosmith, they did a, uh, that at one point in, 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 in the run up to them sort of trying to make this push, they had done a survey of like all the people in the front row of their concerts and every single person there had bought it from a scalper. This was, yeah, the, for, the forum in LA. It was the front section. Everyone, every single person in the front section of the forum in LA had purchased their tickets from a scalper. And the forum was actually that managed, you know, that venue was managed by MCA. 
MCA um, in a contract that they got under Irving Azoff, who would later become Ticketmaster's CEO. So it's this little click, and they saw this from the beginning. Their vision was that we are the middleman between the artist and the fan. This is not a business about selling music. This is not a, a business about moving records or CDs. It is a it is a business about controlling access to the fans, and we have this. And you know, it, 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 in 1990, um, Azoff's um, chief publicist goes to into business with Fred Rosen, and they brag um, about the 33 million um, person database that they have, and how they can you know they're basically going to give corporations access to all of these incredibly passionate fans. And uh, I don't even know if that. Um, would be legal today, but um, but you know these guys have never really worried too much about what the law has to say. Well, you know what's interesting. I mean, wh wh I should say it's almost difficult to to sort of wrap your head around about this, or for me about this whole uh, sort of uh, th th this whole question of Ticketmaster and its various is iterations as they sort of like go and hoover up their competitors and also sort of like not just their direct competitors. But on on sort of like both sides of where they would be having to negotiate with different people, is that there's a there's the 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 from a policy standpoint there's this huge amount of like uh, uh, of antitrust questions that we have as a society ignored really starting in in, in 1980 or so around that time when the the, the Borkian version of of antitrust sort of took over. But there's also just like so much corruption, <laughs> like just really like, like almost petty criminal activity, <laughs> except for the dollar amounts are larger, that that gets like sort of like laced into that story in a way. So it's hard to sort of tease out like, but, but it, it feels like one begets the other. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I mean, I think that that's absolutely true. The thing is, I have covered finance and business for kind of my entire like journalistic career. And the, you know, there's so much overlap between um, organized crime type stuff and, and antitrust monopoly, the way that monopolies operate, um, you know, th these, these, when, when a company gets to so powerful, you know, re the retaliation always kind of, you know, the, the, the lawsuits you read always sound like somebody has been watching too many mafia movies, you know, every that's, that's just kind of the recurring theme over and over again. You see it in pharma, you see it in, 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 you know, uh, every, every aspect of the healthcare. I mean, the healthcare system is completely, you know, mafia, uh, centric in the same way but um but for sure um these gentlemen also have legit medical uh, legit mafia connections um that are have been the subject of numerous books i mean um azoff and um rosen um definitely had uh, a lot of a lot of underworld um uh, figures swimming around them um and um in one character in one in in the best example coming up with the Pearl Jam um, issue, they hired a guy, or they seem to have hired a guy, the Ticketmaster, uh, named Marty Bergman, who was the um, the brother of a very famous uh, 60 Minutes producer, Lowell Bergman, who touted himself, you know, he held himself out as um, sort of his brother's advance man, and that, and that he was working on this um, massive 60 Minutes expose on the concert ticketing industry, and they were going to really get Ticketmaster. And he, and you know, um, ingratiated himself to the entire congressional staff that was doing the investigation on the Congress side, the, the DOJ, a lot of antitrust um, litigators that were working on the um, private um, side. And uh, it turned out he was on the payroll of Ticketmaster. Um, he like, bragged about likely. it. Yeah. Like, I mean, his his wife, um, who was an ex prosecutor, and by the way, they were married, their marriage was officiated by Rudy Giuliani. Um, <laughs> And this guy was also an old friend of Fred Rosen's. Um, he, you know, he later bragged about how he had single-handedly um, sort of uh, stopped the, uh, the the antitrust investigation. But what people who knew him, who had, you know, made the mistake of of sharing um, their information with this uh, guy Marty Bergman, 
um, told me is that after they would talk to him, weird things would start to happen. And so we got these reports, um, two reports, neither one knew about the other um, from, you know, opposite coasts of the country of uh, mysterious break-ins happening in offices and like documents going missing. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot. I mean, I, I found this quote from Eddie Vedder. Um, he said, you know, I it was great to find out what it's like to be crushed by a huge corporate superpower. And he called the defeat, this is in 2000, a template for how politics works. When you put that template onto an issue like the environment or taking jobs out of the country, then it becomes really frightening. And this was in the context of him um, supporting uh, Ralph, Nader, Ralph Nader's um, uh, campaign for presidency in, in 2000. But it was really, you know, I think that everybody that I talked to on the Pearl Jam side was like, it was this moment of um, real just loss of innocence for them, I think. They, they really thought that the Clinton administration were allies. They'd certainly raised a lot of money um, for the Clinton administration. And, uh, and they felt like they'd sort of been um, hung out to dry. And they, they're still, a lot of them are still putting, piecing together what exactly happened because there were so many weird, mysterious things. At one point, wow. Charlie Black, the, um, the, 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 the fixer who, who sort of the lobbyist who um, kind of got the whole thing, took care of the whole thing. And he was also running Phil Graham's presidential campaign. His, um, his, he, he had a lobbying firm with Paul Manafort and Roger Stone. And Roger Stone at one point was trying to get Pearl Jam to hire him. So it was very, very weird stuff. It, there's sort of like a, um, it's uh, it's almost like where, um, you know, an offer you can't refuse becomes sort of like a double entendre, right? Like, I mean, it's like literally both the sort of the nature of of uh, a monopoly and, uh, and and in some respects to monopsony they, they have uh, created. And also then you have guys who are coming in and breaking into your uh, your offices if you have information that you might be giving to uh, congressional hearings. All right, well, so let's talk about the hearings we heard yesterday. It's a different era. And, and, and the, that era was in the wake of a change in the perspective that, that both our government and sort of like the conventional wisdom had on monopolies. And like I said, it, it led up, I think it was in 96, where they rolled back the uh, FinCEN laws that had to do with entertainment and studios could now own the same thing, or I should say networks could own the uh, the material that they were producing out in, in California, in Hollywood. Um, things have swung back with this administration. So what did we hear yesterday? Um, Maybe like I'm curious a, a as to like how how serious you think they're going to go at Ticketmaster, both the administration and it's you know the with I guess starting with the Senate hearings, who was also revealed yesterday like you know Josh Hawley everybody was waiting for his like big uh, you know sort of populist uh, coming out and it seems like he wasn't quite as um, he didn't quite bring the goods that he sort of like, uh, uh that people anticipated. Uh, Krista, give I me mean, your sense of that. I would, yeah, I would say his questioning was very specifically, uh, targeted around like the secondary market essentially. And this data capture, he kept referencing how much data they gather in their secondary market. Um, but I think he was, he clearly was versed in some of the issues of the platform and, I completely agree with you. Uh, not necessarily the populist caring much about the artist at all, really only worried about the fan. But the thing that struck me about this hearing overall is the fact that there was a lot of bipartisan agreement that this um, that this whole entire uh, kind of company has gotten away with. And the artists have not been heard, really. They, When they have spoken out, there's been a lot of silencing. And the agreement between the bipartisan support is that we need to do something about it. And that closing off with Klobuchar saying, you know, this isn't really about uh, throwing popcorn. We're really trying to do something here should at least give the agencies support in whatever comes next. Uh, Mo, from your perspective, like, it, w what is the value of of going after uh, one of these monopolies. And I have to say, like, you know, in terms of like Holly, the way I read that was when you go after data, 
what you're also doing is you're 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 sticking to the line that it's big tech is the problem as opposed to the big part um as opposed you know relative to the tech part um they there's a there's which which i'm all in favor of i'm happy the doj is now suing google and they should be doing they should they should all these companies should be uh, broken into million pieces but there is a there is a sort of like a the, the that flavor is more attractive right now to republicans uh i'm interested in sort of the, the more the the generic uh attack on on that bigness Mo, from your sense what is the value of going after ticketmaster beyond obviously like it's important that we have music in our society and that uh artists be able to make a living at it and that uh, these things are accessible to fans and, 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 but, but the going after this type of monopoly is your, what does it do for other monopolies? I guess. Um, just off the top of my head. I mean, the first thing, because there is that pushback, like, oh, they're interested in going after Ticketmaster. What about the, you know, the supermarket chains? What about, um, the hospital monopolies? And I do a lot of work on hospital monopolies. And that's one of the reasons I was really upset. Um, the, the one thing that really left me disappointed yesterday is that nobody brought up Astro World. Um, one of the biggest harms uh, inflicted by um, monop you know, hospital monopolies is that people die uh, every minute uh, in, in American hospitals from just sheer neglect. Um, and a lot of that is because there is no, you know, they've been all of the competition has been consolidated out of existence. Now, competition is not going to solve our healthcare problems, but where it doesn't exist, your healthcare is 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 abs is is prison like. You know, I've I've done a lot of work on rural healthcare, and the case with um, a lot of Live Nation shows, what I've seen is that um, post pandemic, like a lot of institutions, they've been all about understaffing, under training. At um, Astro World, there was actually a security guard who blew the whistle. He said, "I left early. I left before Travis Scott's show because I." Yeah, didn't I'm sorry. Will you will you tell people about Astro World? Because I'm not sure that people know sure. uh, what you're referring to. In November uh, 2021, um, there was a, a concert that Live Nation put on in conjunction with Travis Scott. Um, Drake was involved um, in Houston at a abandoned amusement park called Astro World. Um, and uh, 10 people uh, died, including a nine-year-old child. Um, hundreds were injured. Um, and the fault, I mean, a lot of fault has been um, pinned on Travis Scott because he continued to play his set through what, you know, clearly ambulances sort of arriving on the scene. Uh, he didn't stop um, the music. The, the performance didn't actually stop until eight people were dead. Um, but Live Nation is the culprit there. I mean, like he was on stage. He couldn't necessarily see. I don't really know what it's like to perform before, you know, tens of thousands of people. Um, and it, it emerged, you know, pretty quickly that Live Nation not only had not appointed an executive producer or a director of concerts, there was really nobody appointed it, it, at that concert uh, to a role that would have enabled them to stop the concert. Um, but it had just, you know, dramatically understaffed the event, potentially oversold the tickets, which is also something that they're accused of doing in the Bad Bunny situation in Mexico, um, where a bunch of uh, thousands of fans got turned away at the door, even though they um, purchased tickets. So they're overbooking like the airplanes. Um, and, uh, and, and there was just no crowd control. There was very, very bad security. Six weeks after Astro World, a rapper um, named Drakeo the Ruler got assassinated by literally a mob of 113 people wearing ski masks and red hoodies. Um, you know, jumped on this guy and um, and and stabbed him to death. And you know, he was he was dead uh, long before the the you know paramedics arrived. So Live Nation is understaffing its events. It's cutting corners. It's um, it's really in, in in this environment where you know we have mass shootings uh, every other week. Um, it's it's a recipe for disaster. Obviously, the largest, um, or maybe not so obviously, but the 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 deadliest mass shooting in history um, 
uh, also happened at a Live Nation event. That was the Route 91 Fest. So they're cutting corners on security. It's going to cost more lives. And that was that that's an element of this kind of um, monopoly control that um, that wasn't addressed yesterday. But I think that like it, that sort of brings us, you know, it brings me back to to why this kind of thing needs to needs to really be stopped. I hope that um, I, you know, I, I wanted, I wish that Ted Cruz had actually been there yesterday because he's been pretty good um, at hearings on Boeing. Um, you know, I think that that's another thing that I hope that we can get the um, the senators to kind of come to bipartisan, uh, you know, agreement on is that, you know, monopolies, no, lack of competition um, is, is actually threatens lives. Um, and we should say, you know, we've, 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 we've followed a lot of the nurses strikes that have happened over the past couple of years now and almost to a strike. The, the primary issue is not um, pay. It is, we need more nurses because we can't have 20 people. We just had one in New York. We had one, uh, we were following one quite uh, closely up in Worcester. Um, The, we need more nurses for the amount of patients we have. And you're a nurse, you work in the ER, you can't see 20 patients in an hour. Somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna die, essentially, uh, if that's the case. Um, and just so that we're clear, can you just like the, the relationship between Ticketmaster and, and Live Nation, the, they're, uh, they're essentially one entity. Yeah, they're the same company. Um, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's something that sort of blows people's mind. And, you know, again, Live Nation was Clear Channel, um, I, our, Clear Channel is now iHeartRadio and Live Nation. But, you know, all of these these entities are very clear. iHeartRadio uh, had the same for a time. They had the same parent company, Liberty Media. Um, you might as well con- consider the entire entertainment industry one. But but no, Live Nation and, and, and Ticketmaster have since 2010 been the same company. And before yeah. that, they were sort of the same company. <laughs> And and where does iHeartRadio fit in? Have they been spun off, or are they also part of like are they? Uh, what's their relationship? They were spun off. They were bought up by private equity. They were then you know they went bankrupt. Um, in like Sirius XM is still in the picture. Sirius XM, yeah, but um, but uh, iHeartRadio then was purchased by John Malone's Liberty Media, which also owns thirty seven percent of Live Nation. Um, but then. Liberty Media is like divested from iHeartRadio. I don't know how close the iHeartRadio Live Nation connection is at this point, but it would be, I think, naive to to suggest there's none at all. So, Krista, what is the solution here? Like, do do I mean, what what authority does the DOJ have? Let's say, or you know, and I guess this would maybe come out of, in the form of a suit or a threatened uh, suit. Um, and maybe there's legislation, but what, like, what a bit, what authority exists, and what policies are on the table to deal with this, um, with this concentration of power that is just basically running this industry? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's important. Mo and I are both pretty. We just sounded very pessimistic about the hearing. I actually think it overall went pretty well. Like, if we had looked at this from 20 years ago, this. This went very well. The guy, John Edgel, who ran the hearing back in the 90s, he was excited about this one. So I will first lay that out. But but in terms of what can be done, you know, it is action from the DOJ. And as American Antitrust Institute, one of the witnesses said yesterday, this really needs to be a structural separation, uh, which would result from a lawsuit, a formal lawsuit from the Department of Justice. It would have to make it past uh, all of the attempts from Live Nation, I'm sure, to get it dismissed and then head to trial. And ultimately, it would be up to a judge. But what a structural separation looks like to me, at least a somewhat successful one, would be a um, would be separating the concert promotion company, Live Nation, from Ticketmaster, and then also separating their uh, artist management company, Frontline Management, that they bought in 2008, which was an Azoff company, uh, Irving Azoff, and then 
uh, you also would probably need to put restrictions around their exclusivity because that is how they have been able to maintain their power thus far. And, you know, they had exclusivity with each other from the 90s onwards before merging. So to invite actual competition and investment in new companies that can innovate and kind of gain market share and to be a competitor, you would need to put guardrails up like that. And I hope the DOJ knows that. So no uh, buying exclusivity. Like you can't come in and say, you're only going to deal with Ticketmaster. Here's a kickback in advance. Here's half a million. Here's 5 million, whatever it is. You can't do that. That you also can't own both the outlet and the, uh, the sales or a substantial piece of the artist in in the in the form of being their agent i mean we saw this in uh, you know there was a big writers strike to to this uh to this end to break break up that relationship between agencies and studios essentially who were double dealing and and cutting out the interests of the people who are actually providing the content um and we should just also say just so that we're clear the hearings they in the in the, themselves are really just sort of like northern stars for the DOJ, right? It's basically just signaling to the DOJ, if you pursue this, you're not going to get blowback from the legislative branch. You're gonna, you're, I mean, you know, you're gonna have trouble uh, on the courts, obviously, to the extent that you do, and maybe it indicates that maybe you know the Senate uh, will, you know, be putting more people on the courts who are going to be more amenable. Uh, to these type of cases, but really the primary thing is you're not going to get a call and get reamed out by by a senator who's going to start to apply pressure on on you. And it, it it just basically gives like a vague green light for the DOJ. And then it's the DOJ is pretty clearly already oriented towards dealing with antitrust. And this is just like a sort of a like a like a green flag or whatever color flag, I guess you get in a, a car race saying go forward with it. In my mind, yeah, for the most part, it's that, you know, there are some legislative uh, changes that they've introduced or thought about introducing the Boss Act being one of them. And they discussed it briefly, which is just around like ticketing transparency, but that won't get at the at the deeper harms. And again, as you said, it's more of a green light hearing to say, these are the issues that people in the industry are talking about. I'm so glad they had an artist and an independent venue to kind of highlight the things that within the industry people are seeing. And then, yeah, like go forth, please, please file a lawsuit. Well, uh, and, and to that end, the, the DOJ, you know, sued, followed up the hearing by immediately uh, filing another <laughs> lawsuit against Alphabet, the, the parent of Google, um, using a lot of the allegations that you saw, you know, the, and, and then a lot of the material that you saw uh, emerge in the um, House Antitrust Subcommittee investigation. So, yeah, we're hoping that these um, these you know, wheels start turning in that right direction. It's important to note that the Senate is where uh, the the antitrust investigation that Pearl Jam uh, launched uh, went you know, went to die. Right, the Senator uh, Phil Graham, um, you know, froze the appropriations, or allegedly he he claims that uh, this is not the case, or he's he's claimed that he it couldn't have happened that way. Um, but uh, but we don't think that the the Senate anymore is. Um, is that ideologically pro monopoly? So that is definitely an amazing thing. Uh, the piece, if folks want to go check it out at the uh, prospect at the American Prospect, which I would highly recommend. It was, uh, it's really, uh, it, I mean, it's like a, it honestly does feel like Goodfellas on some level. Um, uh, it's called uh, Ticketmaster's Dark History. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm. Krista Brown, uh, Mo Tatsik, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. 